A funny thing happened on the way to this conference. Um, uh, the title that uh, was reproduced was from an article I wrote some time ago when I was actually consulting with NASA. Um, and there's a long story behind that. But so what I, I also wrote about 20 years ago an article on the human right to health. And I've also written a couple articles on the human right to access to information. And so this gave me an opportunity to take together these diverse threads and somehow put them together. And so um, I want to really thank um, the, uh, you know, Sean and Peter and Molly and um, Larry yeah. uh, for putting this together and inviting me to participate. It, it's great fun. Um, thinking about these things again. So um, let's see. Um, I, and I view all those prior panels as, as simply the introduction to my talk. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and I say that actually uh, really meaning just one thing, and that is that um, I had to keep editing my talk um, over and over because they kept covering all the stuff I was going to say. Um, but so here we go. Um, <coughs> Uh, no one has really tried to give a definition of international human rights, so I'm going to throw one out. Uh, you know, cover a couple of spotty things here before I get to the core of what I'm talking about. A claim or an interest or a need or a demand, which is cognizable under law and which proceeds from moral precepts necessary for the respect for human dignity. And I think that the attempt here is to try to separate this from a straight up moral rights and also to not get tied up too much in the language of um, whether or not it can be enforced in court or not. So we have this cognizable under law. You don't always have to have something enforceable for it to be recognized in law. And we do this in the United States all the time with environmental law and so on. There's a lot of people can't enforce those things, uh, but there's rules you have to abide by. Um, so I think that that's an interesting definition that helps to constrain a little bit what we're talking about here. And this includes both the, um, the uh, negative rights that we are familiar with more in the United States, as well as the more affirmative rights. Another concept that really didn't get floated today, and again, I know this is a very expert body, so forgive me, but the idea of progressive realization, that the right isn't to know, everybody doesn't instantly get a cell phone and so on, it's about progressive realization, that the states are committed to progressively realize those economic, social, and cultural rights, and that that is an important important understanding for how these treaties are to work. It's not that we're going to instantly turn around and everybody has enough food and health care and all the rest. It's to take steps, affirmative steps, to progressively realize those. And one aspect that hasn't been really covered today is what I've been calling the informational aspect, particularly the right to health. Um, we heard a lot about the patents and the provision of drugs. When we think about the right to health, we tend to think about the provision of health care. We tend to think about uh, those aspects, or even even maybe you know, a clean environment and things like that. But there's also this whole informational aspect, and this will tie back to the empowerment. And that is to say, knowledge of what a good environment is. That's how you can then create the lobbying effort to get a good environment from the uh, government and from others. Safe working conditions, diet, hygiene, knowledge of healthcare providers, who they are, what they do, uh, knowledge to become one. Knowledge of why you should take the stairs instead of the elevator. Um, so there's this whole informational aspect um, to the progressive realization uh, that, again, wasn't really discussed today, so that I will get to. Um, these I'll blow through in an instant here. You can look these up yourself, but the right to health, you notice part two here, talks about reduction of the stillbirth rate, improvement of aspects of the environment, industrial hygiene. Very instrumental very targeted at states you should be doing these things, but not informational. Uh, you can look at my article see why I say it should be informational. Uh, access to information. Uh, people have the right to hold information, but you also, under the international standards, Article 19, and I know we have someone here from Article 19, um, have the, uh, the right to access information. And I think that in healthcare, that is a critically important thing. Critically important thing. And then, um, Article 15, of course, has already been covered at length. I'm not going to go back into that, except to just highlight the right to take part in cultural life and to scientific information is not just the right to get that stuff. It's the right to create that stuff. Okay. Uh, again, human rights, negative. S government, stop that. Don't do that. That's our First Amendment, right? <laughs> Affirmative. Do something, hopefully valuable. Uh, progressive realization. Enforceability is a tough one. 
Does it have to be enforceable in court, or can it be something that you can enforce through other means or take other steps to? And I say, and part of that definition, cognizable under law, it has to be something you can do something with in law, even if you can't take it into the court and enforce it right now. We now have a um, nearly universal health care in the United States that now has given legal rights. That doesn't, you know, we got there, finally. Um, but it also includes that political advocacy. And I want to tie back just for a minute to um, uh, Mr. Latif's point, and that is about the importance of rhetoric. We get there in part because we believe the words, because we use the words. The words become the law, if you will. It's not just that we have these wonderful instruments that are now 50 and 60 years old. It's that we believe them and that that starts to define our discourse. That starts to define how we think of things. And that's where I agree entirely that the um, visual impaired person's treaty with its use of language that brings IP and uh, and uh, human rights right together in the same sentence is an important development rhetorically. And it's something that I will certainly push uh, whenever I can. What I'm going to actually thread together in my talk are this idea of social justice. And there's just two aspects of social justice, is a very protean concept, put it wherever you want, plus, but inclusion and empowerment. And I think at some level, human rights are about inclusion and empowerment. Certainly cultural rights are part of that. Uh, but also this empowerment side also gets ignored. It's, that it's not just about government stop doing that or, or give me health. It's empower me to have health. Empower me to take steps for myself. And it's that empowerment side that I think is particularly important to be thinking about for IP. Because part of the way you empower people is to give them the power to create new information and to profit from it. But also we have to be careful about are we going to disempower people by excluding them from the information because of the way the IP regime is structured. International Human Right to Health, again I'm focusing particularly on the informational aspects and then primarily on copyright as opposed to other um, things. Social justice, inclusion, particularly those who are marginalized or excluded. That's what we want to include because those of us like me who are already privileged, I'm already included. Maybe not when I play Go or some other strange things that I do or sitar, but, but other than that, I'm you know pretty ordinary, pretty normal, pretty much in the mainstream in the United States and I'm included and I've got all the wealth and everything that I could ever dream to have and so on, but not everybody's like that, not all of my students are like that. A lot of my students are first time to graduate from high school, the first one in their family to graduate from high school, coming from a different background. Inclusion can happen at any scale. It can happen at that individual, include them in the bigger group. It can happen at that excluded ethnic group, include them in the bigger group. It can happen at the country, include them in the community of nations. We can do this at any scale. In Africa, there's NEPAD, which is attempting to have regional solutions to some IP problems and development problems. And that's, again, an inclusion as opposed to exclusion. Empowerment, providing the environment, social, economic, cultural, physical. Uh, political, appropriate to, and I would add this, punch this word, entrepreneurial efforts of all sorts. You don't usually hear entrepreneurial and together with human rights. But what is empowering? It's to get people to be able to do things that otherwise might be stopped. And there's a big relationship between creative effort that can have an intellectual property uh, result and entrepreneurship. Or you might just be the one who's disseminating the information or disseminating the drugs or providing the health care and so on that's using that entrepreneurial spirit to create something. Okay, um, I had to have a graphic, and I'll get to some more. And so I thought I'd use an antique one here. Copyright does not protect ideas. And of course, how many people recognize what this is? Yes, it's a light bulb. Yes, okay. This is actually an incandescent light bulb. You can't really tell from where you are. Um, and it's what we used to use to symbolize thinking and ideas. I know some of you are nodding your heads. You're as old as I am. Okay, so... Uh, copyright does protect the expression of those ideas, so those ideas are free for the taking. Um, copyright can be an engine for or a break on development. And this is another important point that I think hasn't been mentioned yet, that copyright still can be used for development, and that development includes realizing human rights. And it can take a variety of forms. Um, here we have a little graphic I stole from the Internet. Um, the graphic, of course, with the heart lifting weights, that's good for your heart, okay? That's a little graphic that conveys information. Somebody can create this and sell this. It could be movies, born into brothels. 
That's something that is doing some human rights work using a copyrighted work. Um, so, copyright for health. This is information, and if we're blocking to, and, and so this gives information to people if you have access to the web, it gives you all kinds of information about it, and this of course has a lot to do with health, and I go there all the time, and I also go to the Mayo Clinic, and I also go to the whatever I can find, and then I average them. After a long day, we like to unwind it. Yeah, usually with a nice glass or two of something. But it's funny how the drink sneaks up on you. The trouble is, it sneaks up on your organs too, giving them a hard time. And can lead to lots of nasty things like a stroke, mouth cancer, liver and heart disease. Luckily, we didn't have to give it up. We got a bit sneaky too. Like giving the drink a few nights off every week. Um, and you can create a little animation with claymation figures or fake claymation figures and do it all digital to provide information that can reach out in ways that other things can't. So, and of course, that's a little copyrighted work that actually some provides some good information in a 49-second clip. Um, uh, so again, we see that copyright mediates a lot of this important stuff. Um, information connections. There's um, information is related to inclusion and power in an obvious way. Information is related to copyright, obviously, and their information is related to health. As an aside, uh, the human rights aspects to internet access. That's an important thing, and I'm not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> somebody else has already mentioned it today. That's one of those things that oh, I could talk for, for 20 minutes on just that. Okay, so. Um, information, social justice, inclusion. Inclusion, what's going on? Uh, let me in, okay? Uh, it's in a uh, graphic here, just to make the point. Um, and then empowerment. Information is power. We've all heard this before, and this is a person getting empowered by Zeus. Um, and, and the person next to him, I know you can't really read this, is, it's a good thing you've got rubber-soled shoes on. That could have gone all the way through you. It, it's just a stupid little joke, but it's, again, just to to emphasize the inclusion and empowerment with graphics, using graphics to convey information. And graphics convey information to us, they convey information to anybody, and this is copyrightable work. And the idea is that for health, you can do all of these same kinds of things, um, uh, any sorts of comics and so on. Social justice perspective uh, can inform the way we shape an IP regime. If we want to have inclusion and empowerment as central values, that affects the way we create our IP regime. And indeed, inclusion is, of course, part of human rights directly. It says you have the cultural right to do yourself. You have the right to, as we heard in the earlier panel, um, the uh, Article 15 of the ESC. You have the right to participate uh, in those uh, benefits. And empowerment can also inform. If we want to empower people to create stuff, of the little things that I was showing you, that's going to look a little differently than what we might have had. And so part of the question we have is, is IP there to protect the people in power, or is it to empower everyone? All right. And what are we going to do with it uh, as human rights advocates and with the language? Are we going to now take that language from the uh, VIP treaty and move it forward, or are we just going to say, well, that was good, yay, we did it, but we're done now. Um, Empowerment for your own health, empowerment to get into the business of healthcare, to include and empower others. Uh, copyright information, health and environment, that says it all, empowerment says it all. Who creates the works to distribute? Is it going to be the government that creates them? Is it going to be individuals? How are we going to structure our solution? Who, who pays for them? Is it going to be, I'm going to get some people to help me do it and pay for it myself? Is it going to be like Alexis Ohanian and Reddit, where he and his college friend create this thing, and then they sell it for lots of money? And by the way, Reddit doesn't use any copyright. It's open source, so if you want to... Oh, sorry. I'm done. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> distribution of copyright works. Who pays for it? How does it get done? Again, the government can do it. We could buy it, sell it, and distribute it. But we can also have another model that says individuals do it. And we empower that. We create the structures that allow individuals and corporations even to do this sort of thing. Uh, who controls the content? The piper, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So how we structure this has a degree of what control the content. And then the last one is for you to decipher on your own. Central control versus what? OK, a thousand flowers blooming. All right, so um, that's a field with flowers if you can't tell from where you see. 
Um, the government can play these different roles. Um, this next link, which I'm not going to take time to go to, is of course the Apple, the famous Big Brother Apple computer um, commercial from the 1984 World Series, um, uh, Super Bowl. Uh, last idea that hasn't been presented today, again, it's a hodgepodge of ideas, is we should take a lawyering approach to this. This is not a top-down thing. This is not a one-size-fits-all. Yes, we need to add information and content to our standards. We need to engage in some standard development. But really, local conditions drive it. What is really going on locally? We should take a problem-solving approach to it, not one-size-fits-all. Don't just take the U.S. Uh, IP regime put another country's name on it. It won't work. That just won't work. We do have the standards of standard setting. That's good, but we also then have to look at implementation at different levels. Uh, conclusion. A couple words. You've heard it before. Social justice, inclusion, and empowerment, a way to look at IP and human rights, a way to think about implementing them. It provides a useful perspective for thinking about International human rights and IP, not IP as a human right, not human rights as a limit on IP, which we've heard a lot about today, but actually IP and human rights engaged in a common endeavor. And that's how I view this inclusion and empowerment idea is that you know, we can, in the old metaphor, get on both, both people on the same side of the table here that we are not antithetical, that we are, in fact, engaged in the same sort of thing, inclusion, empowerment, social justice, not just making money for a few people. Thank you.